All right, chapter six. Chapter six now. Interpersonal communication and conversation. What I want to do is I want to run through the parts of a conversation with you, and then we're going to put you in groups of three, and you're going to have conversations so that you practice recognizing the parts of a conversation. Conversations are actually fairly uh, well structured and fairly well ordered, not because there are some rules in our brain, but because this is the way you always do it, and if you don't do it this way, it always feels awkward. Uh, linguists are the people who study conversation, and they have created a system of understanding it that they call conversational analysis, or for short, CA, conversational analysis. And what linguists have found by listening to tons of conversation, and when you hear this, you'll, you'll realize, oh yeah, that's true, I, we do that. What linguists have found is that our conversations almost inevitably, not inevitably, but almost inevitably, take the following form. We begin with an opening. The opening is where we say things like, hi, how are you? And we give our name, if we're long distance. My dad um, was born in Sweden, immigrated in 1926, and he kept contact with his sisters and his brothers back home in Sweden. He wrote letters once a year. This is very typical of, of this immigrant group. And he had one sister, after the telephone became affordable, he had one sister he would call every year on her birthday. Her birthday was in August. And he would get up at 6 in the morning to call her during the middle of her day. And he had not talked to her for a whole year. And he would get her on the phone, and he would never say to her, Hello, how are you? This is Oscar. He would just start into his business. And you had to think that his sister, even though it's his sister, that she went, What? Who's this? Who's this? Because you do that. Have you ever started, do you ever start a conversation without ever saying hello? Or some form of it? Hey, what's happening? What's going on? Some kind of a, a greeting that starts it off? Have you ever had somebody who did, did that to you? Mm -hmm. Well, how does it feel? Uh, Brandon, when, when they just start in. Kind of weird almost. Yeah, it's a little weird. It's awkward. It's just awkward. The next thing we do in our conversation, we, we have an opening where we just greet one another. We sometimes make a little small talk there. And this small talk was called by a linguist phatic conversation. And its purpose is to grease the wheels, get things ready for the conversation. Usually then, we offer some kind of feed forward. And in this part of the conversation, what we usually do is we tell people why we're do why we're having this talk. Oh, you know, wait a minute, Megan, um, I needed to talk to you about Kate. I loved your paper, but okay, we 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 tell people why are we having this conversation? What's going to go on in this conversation? That's usually fairly fairly quick. And it leads us right into the business of the conversation. And this is usually the longest part of the conversation. And it can loop back. That is, we can, we can conduct, we may have more than one item of business that we need to conduct with one another. Or I may have an item of business and you may have an item of business. You know, while we're talking about that, I need, to, I need to get to, and sometimes that feed forward of the other's business may come early in the conversation, or it may be after we finish my business, then you have a chance to, do, to, to bring up your business in the conversation. And we may, we may loop that several times. 
But there's always going to be somebody, you're going to tell me what we're doing, what is it we're going to talk about, and then we're going to talk about it. In the conversation then, after we've finished all our business, we have a moment of feed back. Now, in, in our model of communication, we talked about feedback and a feedback loop. What we meant by that was simply that kind of informal uh, way of conveying to the other how you're responding at the moment. Whether that's with a yawn, or, or with a head nod, or with a verbal exchange. That's how in communication studies we use feedback. The linguists in conversational analysis use feedback in a slightly different sense. The feedback is the signal to the conversation partner that the conversation is drawing to an end, that we have finished all our business. So you might say, you got anything else you want to say? Yeah. Uh, so have we covered everything? I think, I think I've gotten it all out. Do you have anything? It's that signal to the other that we are coming to the end. So while there may be internal feedback loops, this form of feedback is slightly different. And the linguist means something slightly different than the communication people mean by this. We need to make that distinction because in analyzing a conversation, we'll see that there are several moments of feedback within the conversation, but only one time at which we signal to the other that it's time to close. So I got to go is a feedback. It's signaling to the other that we have to go, that we're coming to an end. Say, say goodbye, say hello to your mother for me. Uh, tell, um, greet all of the people out there when you go home. Brad, tell them all hi for me, okay? You going home this weekend? I'm going to Arizona. Yeah, well, you know, Arizona. wave to Arizona for me. Okay. Make sure you got your papers. Okay, and then finally, there is the moment of closing. We've signaled to the conversational partner we're going to close the conversation, and then we close it. Now, this doesn't always happen. This is one of the things that, particularly among young people, this gets dropped. But it's that moment where you go, yo, see ya, in some form or fashion. But sometimes you don't do that. Sometimes you don't do that. Sometimes you just walk off. Right? Have you had people just walk off at the end of the conversation? They don't, they don't, say, they don't just say, kiss my foot. They don't say goodbye. They don't say anything. They just, they just walk off. They, you've had, you probably have had people do that. And it feels the same as when they don't bother to say, hey, it feels awkward. Because this is the way we have been socialized to have our conversations. Now, parts can drop out. But every time you drop a part out, if you don't give some kind of feed forward, like, you know, I need, a, I need to talk to you about, and you just launch into your business, that other person goes, well, wait, what? Why are we talking about this? You know, if you, if you just launch into things, people are nonplussed. They don't know quite what to make of it. That's the structure of the conversation. If you turn to page, all of this is, is on page 121 through page 124. The other thing that we need to talk about briefly is turn-taking dialogue and immediacy. Now, DeVito laid out uh, conversational uh, principles earlier on page 76, and you'll want to go back to them, but turn-taking principles are very important. And there are basically four li two listener, two speaker turn-taking principles. First of all, as a speaker, we may try to maintain a turn, as I'm doing right now. 
you notice I could have I could have stopped after going through the principles and said, okay, let's do our exercise, but I wanted to get through this, so I said, now let's go on to this. And you do that sometimes in conversation. Turn maintaining uh, turn maintaining cues are sometimes verbal. I need to keep talking more. Sometimes nonverbal. How do you maintain a a, a turn nonverbally? Miss by thinking. Oh, if you stop and think, what happens, Taryn? What happens if you stop and think? And what happens to your conversational partner? They'll butt in. They'll butt in. They'll they'll take it. So you can't. That's the one thing you can't do. If you want to maintain your turn, you have to keep talking. This is where those vocalized pauses become very handy, because you just keep it going. You can't say, "Wait, I'm not done yet." You you do things like that. You you do say, and, and I still need to talk to you about, in order to maintain your your uh, your your turn. You also offer some turn yielding cues, and the first one is you shut up. What are you feeling right now, Ashley? When I shut up, what what were you feeling? Okay. 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 Kate, okay. okay. what were you feeling? Were you afraid to say something else? Were you getting to feel a little nervous? Because it went a little bit long, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So it, when it goes long, you you start to get nervous, and your nerves will push you in. That's a turn yielding cue. What's another turn yielding cue? You might say to the other person, so what do you think? Oh, I've been talking so much. I, I want to hear from you. Melody, yeah, I've been talking so much. I want to hear from you. What do you think? About? There you go. There you go. As listener, you have two, two sets of cues. One is a turn requesting cue. How do you request a turn? Can I say something about that? Okay. How do you request a turn? Excuse me? How do you request a turn? Can I say something? Okay. How do you request a turn, Brad? Excuse me. Excuse me. What else could you do besides excuse me or can you I say start something? Talking. Yeah, just start talking. Don't be nice. You don't be nice. You raise your hand. You, you, <laughs> no, don't raise your hand. You go, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you can do it both verbally and non verbally. As a listener, you can experience a turn denying cue that's down at the bottom of page 125. This is the only one that's difficult. Turn denying cues indicate your reluctance to assume the role of the speaker. So, Melody just gave us a turn denying cue. When I said, Melody, I want to hear from you, and she said, About. Exactly. That's a turn denying cue. Another could be, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. And then finally, we, we send lots of indications that we are listening or are not listening. And these are called back channel cues. Back channel cues. Back channel cues are those head nods, they're the, the nonverbal uh-huh. They're even, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. They even can be some verbal stuff. All of this is what's on the quiz tonight. So let's practice using these. And what I want you to do is just get into groups of three. Let's go as, as far as it'll go. One guy, two women. So Brad with Cece and Megan and Ashley and Kate with, I don't know, one of you three guys in the back row. And then just, okay, one guy with, with two women. And then it'll just have to be guys. Yeah.